There's a great principle for reading Plato. Any paragraph, any sentence, any phrase that has any profound expression or idea will be under translated. Now that's true for Plato. It's true for Chinese philosophy. It's true for because um, a lot of people learn a language but uh, haven't mastered the subject that they may be translating. Uh, so when you're aware of that, check other translations that will confirm it then put it aside and then you can see what's really going on, make up your own. Unless you know Igmar, in which case he would call on Barbara. <laughs> Barbara will open it up and explore it. Right? And the Guia will get involved in it. That's so right. become translated. <laughs> okay. Let's get a couple of readers and we'll play. We're going to hit a couple of good ones. And I'm going to call on Barbara to do some work if she doesn't mind. Okay. Not at all. So let's get a couple of readers first. We go through it. Ah, good. The, 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 re, I, the way you read last time was perfect. Slow, deliberate. Good, good, good. We need another reader? Come on. That boy. I don't have it. Ingmar has to read. He has a translation of it. Anne Marie raised her hand. Yeah, okay. Uh, you go by the same principle? Loud? Slow. Mint, mint feeling. With Gesundheit. That's Chinese for something. I read today. On page 517. And Come here then, noble creatures. Can you give And persuade the fair young Phaedrus that unless you pay proper attention to philosophy, you'll never be able to speak properly about anything. And let Phaedrus answer. Could you ah. hold it? Can we get you up here? Thank you. Say yes. Yes. Good. What's the, what's the, uh, hold it. Could 261. You, 261. Can you move your chair forward, please, Linda? Oh, okay. Then we can get in on right here. Am I Phaedrus? Yeah. Okay. Ask your questions. Am I got to find No, no, no. Come on, ask your questions. Ba ba boom! Do it in Italian. <laughs> Some panache. Okay, so 261 is the. That's French. The number. Not if you do it. Panache. In, that is, but if you do it, that would be Italian. 
<laughs> Listen, I know. I was raised in Boston. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm Ask Boston. your questions. Hey. That's it. But then you do. <laughs> Ask your questions. Throw some Italian in there, right? <laughs> we okay, so the next word is, is Socrates, come hither then? It's not rhetoric. No, it's not rhetoric. It's not rhetoric. It's at the bottom of 517. Next word. Next word. Oh. Are you even on the right? Oh, here we go. Here we go. Okay, I see. Okay. This is me. And Here's one the other chair. Must not the red, the red, the this one. Oh, okay. Yeah, so now I gotta find it again. Okay, <laughs> 517. Right at the bottom. <clears throat> Is not rhetoric in its entire nature. an art which leads the soul by means of words, not only in law courts and the various other public assemblages, but in private companies as well? And is it not the same when concerned with small things as with great and, properly speaking, no more to be esteemed and important than in trifling matters? Is this what you have heard? No, by Zeus. Not that exactly. But the art of speaking and writing is exercised chiefly in lawsuits, and that of speaking also in public assemblies. And I never heard of any further uses. Then you have heard only of the treaties on rhetoric by Nestor and Odysseus, which they wrote when they had nothing to do at Troy. And you have not heard of that by Parmenides. Palamides. Nor of Nestor's either, unless you are disguising Gorgias under the name of Nestor and Thrasymachus, or Theodorus under that of Odysseus. Perhaps I am. However, Never mind them, but tell me, what do the parties in a lawsuit do in court? Do they not contend in speech, or what shall we say they do? Exactly that. About the just and the unjust? Yes. Then he who's speaking is an art will make the same thing appear to the same persons at one time just, and at another, if he wishes, unjust? Certainly. And in political speaking, he will make the same things seem to the state at one time good, and at another the opposite? Just so. Do we not know that the Eleatic Palamedides, Zeno, has such an art of speaking that the same things appear to his hearers to be alike and unlike, one and many, stationary and in motion? Certainly. Then the art of contention in speech is not confined to courts and political gatherings, but apparently, if it is an art at all, it would be one and the same in all kinds of speaking. The art by which a man will be able to produce a resemblance between all things between which it can be produced and to bring to the light the resemblances produced and disguised by anyone else. What do you mean by that? I think it will be plain if we examine the matter in this way. Is deception easier when there is much difference between things or when there is little? When there is little. 
And if you make a transition by small steps from anything to its opposite, you will be more likely to escape detection than if you proceed by leaps and bounds. Of course. Then he who is the deceive he is to deceive another and is not to be deceived himself must know accurately the similarity and the dissimilarities of things. Yes, he must. Now, will he be able, not knowing the truth about a given thing, to recognize in other things the great or small degrees of likeness to that which he does not know? It is impossible. In the case, then, of those whose opinions are at variance with facts and who are deceived, this error evidently slips in through some resemblances. It does happen in that way. Then he who does not understand the real nature of things will not possess the art of making his hearers pass from one thing to its opposite by leading them through the intervening resemblances or of avoiding such deception himself. Never in the world. Then, my friend, he who knows not the truth but pursues opinions will, it seems, attain an art of speech which is ridiculous and not an art at all. Probably. Shall we look at the speech of Lysias, which you have with you, and in what I said, for something which we think shows art and the lack of art? By all means, for now our talk is too abstract, since we lack sufficient examples. And by some special good fortune, as it seems, the two discourses contain an example of what the Example of the way in which one who knows the truth may lead his hearers on with supportive words. Sportive. And I, sp sportive words. And I, Phaedrus, think the divinities of the place are the cause thereof, and perhaps, too, the prophets of the muses who are singing above our heads may have granted this boon to us by inspiration. At any rate, I possess no art of speaking. So be it. Only make your meaning clear. Read me the beginning of Lysias' discourse. You know what my condition is, and you have heard how I think it is to our advantage to arrange these matters. And I claim that I ought not to be refused what I ask, because I am not your lover. For lovers repent of... Stop. Now we must tell what there is in this that is faulty and lacks art, must we not? Yes. It is clear to everyone that we are in accord about some matters <laughs> of this kind and at variance about others, is it not? I think I understand your meaning, but express it still more clearly. When was one says iron or silver, we all understand the same thing, do we not? Surely. What if he says justice or goodness? Do we not part company and disagree with each other and with ourselves? Certainly then in some things we agree, and in others we do not. True. Then, in which of the two are we more easy to deceive, and in which has rhetoric the greater power? Evidently, in the class of doubtful things. Then, he who is to develop an art of rhetoric must first make a method method. A lot methodical. methodical division and acquire a clear impression of each class that in which people must be in doubt and that in which they are not. He who has acquired that 
would have conceived an excellent principle. And I think when he has to do with a particular case, he will not be ignorant, but will know clearly to which of the two classes the thing belongs about which he is to speak. Of course. Well then, to which does love belong? To the doubtful things or the others? To the doubtful, surely. If he did not, do you think he would have let you say what you said just now about him, that he is an injury to the beloved and to the lover, and again, that he is the greatest of blessings? Excellent. But tell me this. For I was in such an ecstasy that I have quite forgotten whether I defined love in the beginning of my discourse. Yes, by Zeus, and wonderfully well. Oh, how much more versed the nymphs, daughters of Achelius and Pan, son of Hermes, are in the art of speech than Lysias, son of Cephalus. Or am I wrong? And did Lysias also, in the beginning of his discourse on love, compel us to suppose love to be some one thing which he chose to consider it? And did he then compose and finish his discourse with that in view? Shall we read the beginning of it again? If you like. But what you seek is not in it. Read that I may hear Lysias himself. You know what my condition is, and you have heard how I think it is to our advantage to arrange these matters. And I claim that I ought not to be refused what I ask, because I am not your lover. For lovers repent of the kindnesses they have done when their passion ceases. He certainly does not at all seem to do what we demand, for he does not even begin at the beginning, but undertakes to swim on his back up the current of his discourse from its end, and begins with what the lover would say at the end to his beloved. Am I not right, Phaedrus, my dear? Certainly that of which he speaks is an ending. And how about the rest? Don't you think the parts of the discourse are thrown out helter-skelter? Or does it seem to you that the second topic had to be put second for any cogent reason, or that any of the other things he says are so placed? It seems to me, who am wholly ignorant, that the writer uttered boldly whatever occurred to him. Do you know any rhetorical reason why he arranged his topics in this order? You flatter me in thinking that I can discern his, his motives so accurately. But I do think you will agree to this, that every discourse must be organized, like a living being with a body of its own, as it were, so as not to be headless or footless, but to have a middle and members compose in fitting relation to each other and to the whole. Certainly. See then whether this is the case with your friend's discourse or not. You will find that it is very like the instructions that some say the is in the inscription that some say is inscribed on the tomb of Midas the Phrygian. What sort of inscription is that, and what is the matter with it? This is it. A bronze maiden am I, and I am placed upon the tomb of Midas. So long as water runs and tall trees put forth leaves, remaining in this very spot upon a much lamented tomb, I shall declare to passers by that Midas is buried here. And you perceive, I fancy, that it makes no difference whether any line of it is put first or last. You are making fun of our discourse, Socrates. Then to spare your feelings, let us say no more of this discourse. 
and yet I think there are many things in it which would be useful examples to consider, though not exactly to imitate. And let us turn to the other discourses, for there was in them, I think, something which those who wish to investigate rhetoric might well examine. What do you mean? The two discourses were obvi opposites. For one maintained that the lover and the other that the non-lover should be favored. And they did it right manfully. <laughs> I thought you were going to speak the truth and say madly. However, that is just what I had in mind. We say that love was a kind of madness, did we not? Yes. And that there are two kinds of madness, one arising from human diseases and the other from a divine release from the customary habits. Certainly. And we made four divisions of the divine madness, ascribing them to four gods, saying that prophecy was inspired by Apollo, the mystic madness by Dionysius, the poetic by the muses, and the madness of love inspired by Aphrodite and Eros, we said was the best. We described the passion of love in some sort of figurative manner, expressing some truth, perhaps, and perhaps being led away in another direction. And after composing a somewhat plausible discourse, we chanted a, support, a sportive and mythic hymn in meat and pious strain to the honor of your Lord and mine, Phaedrus, love, the guardian of beautiful boys. Yes, and I found it very pleasant to hear. Here, let us <clears throat> take up this point and see how the discourse succeeded in passing from blame to praise. What do you mean? It seems to me that the discourse was, as a whole, really sportive jest. But in these chance utterances were involved two principles, the essence of which it would be gratifying to learn if art could teach it. What principles? That of perceiving and bringing together in one idea the scattered particulars that one may clear, make clear by definition the particular thing which he wishes to explain. Just as now in speaking of love, we said what he is and defined it, whether well or ill. Certainly by this means the discourse acquired clearness and consistency. And what is the other principle, Socrates? That <coughs> of dividing things again by classes, where the natural joints are, and not trying to break any apart after the manner of a bad carver. As our two discourses just now assumed one common principle, unreason, and then, just as the body, which is one, is naturally divisible into two, right and left, with parts called by the same names, so our two discourses conceived of madness as naturally one principle within us, and one discord cutting off the left hand part continued to divide this until it found among its parts a sort of left handed love, which it very justly reviled, reviled but the other discourse, lending us to the right-hand part of madness, found a love having the same name as the first, but divine, which it held up to view and praised as the author of our greatest blessings. Very true. Now, I myself, Phaedrus, am a lover of these processes of division, and bringing together as aids to speech and thought and if I think any other man is able to see things that can naturally be collected into one and divided into many, him I follow after and walk in his footsteps as if he were a god. And 
whether the name I give to those who can do this right or wrong, God knows, but I have called them hitherto dialecticians. But tell me, now what name to give to those who are taught by you and Lysias, or is this that art of speech by means of which Thrasymachus and the rest become able speakers themselves and make others so if they are willing to pay them royal tribute. They are royal men, but not trained in the matters about which you ask. I think you give this method the right name when you call it dialectic, but it seems to me that rhetoric still escapes us. What do you mean? Can there be anything of importance which is not included in these processes and yet comes under the head of art? Certainly you and I must not neglect it, but must say what it is that remains of rhetoric. A great many things remain, Socrates, the things that are written in the books on rhetoric. Thank you for reminding me. You mean that there must be an introduction first at the beginning of the discourse. These are the things you mean, are they not? The niceties of the art. Yes. And the narrative must come second with the testimony after it. And third, the proofs. And fourth, the probabilities and confirmation and further confirmation are mentioned. I believe by the man from Byzantium that most excellent artist in words. You mean the worthy Theodorus? <clears throat> of course. And he tells how refutation and further refutation must be accomplished, both in accusation and in defense. Shall we not bring the illustrious Parian Evenus into our discussion, who invented covert allusion and indirect praises? And some say that he also wrote indirect censures, composing them in verse as an aid to memory. For he is a clever man, and shall we leave Gorgias and Tisius undisturbed, who saw that probabilities are more to be esteemed than truths, who make small things seem great and great things small by the power of their words, and new things old and old things the reverse, and who invented conciseness of speech and measureless length on all subjects. And once when Prodigus heard these inventions, he laughed and said that he alone had discovered the art of proper speech, that discourses should be neither long nor short, but of reasonable length. Oh, Prodicus, how clever. And shall we not mention Hippias, our friend from Ellis? I think he would agree with him. Oh, yes. And what shall we say of Polus and his shrines of learned speech, such as duplication and sententiousness and figurativeness and what of the names with which <coughs> Lysimus presented him to effect beautiful diction. Were there not some similar inventions of Protagoras, Socrates? Yes, my boy. Correctness of diction and many other fine things. For cheerful speeches to arouse pity for old age and poverty, I think the precepts of the mighty child Sidonian hold the palm. And he is also a genius, as he said, at rousing large companies to wrath and soothing them again by his charms when they are angry and most powerful in devising and abolishing calumnies on any grounds whatsoever. But all seem to be in agreement concerning the conclusions of discourses, which some call recapitulation, while others give it some other name. You mean making a summary of the points of the speech at the end of it, so as to remind the hearers of what has been said? These are the things I mean. These and anything else 
you can mention concerned with the art of rhetoric? There are only little things not worth mentioning. Never mind the little things. Let us bring these other things more under the light and see what force of art they have and when. They have a very powerful force, at least in large assemblies. They have, but my friend, see if you agree with me in thinking that their warp has gaps in it. Go on and show then. Tell me, if anyone should go to your friend Eximachus, or to his father Acumenus, and should say, I know how to apply various drugs to people so as to make them warm or, if I wish, cold. And I can make them vomit, if I like, or can make their bowels move, and all that sort of thing. And because of this knowledge, I claim that I am a physician and can make any other man a physician to whom I impart the knowledge of these things. What do you think they would say? They would ask him, of course, whether he knew also whom he ought to cause to do these things, and when and how much. If then he should say, no, not at all, but I think that he who has learned these things from me will be able to do by himself the things you ask about. They would say, I fancy, that the man was crazy. And because he had real, read something in a book or had stumbled upon some medicines, imagined that he was a physician when he really had no knowledge of the art. And what if someone should go to Sophocles or Euripides and should say that he knew how to make very long speeches about a small matter and a very short one about a great affair and pitiful utterances if he wished, and gain terrible, and again, terrible and threatening ones, and all that sort of thing, and that he thought by imparting those things he could teach the art of writing tragedies? They also, I fancy, Socrates, would laugh at him. If he imagined that tragedy was anything else than the proper combination of these details in such a way that they harmonize with each other and with the whole composition. But they would not. I suppose rebuke him harshly, but they would le behave as a musician would if he met a man who thought he understood harmony because he could strike the highest and lowest notes. He would not say roughly, you wretch, you are mad. But being a musician, he would say in gentler tones, My friend, he who is to be a harmonist must know these things you mention, but nothing prevents one who is at your stage to to knowledge, of knowledge from being quite ignorant of harmony. You know the, ne the ne necessary preliminaries of harmony, but not harmony itself. Quite correct. So Sophocles would say that the man exhibited the preliminaries of tragedy, but not tragedy itself and acumenus, that he knew the preliminaries of medicine, not medicine itself. Exactly so. Well then, if the mellifluous Adrastus or Pericles heard of the excellent accomplishments which we just enumerated, brachiologies and figurative speech, and all the other things we said we must bring to the light and examine. Do we suppose they would, like you and me, be so ill-bred as to speak discourteously of those who had written and taught these things as the art of rhetoric? Would they not, since they are wiser than we, censure us also and say, Phaedrus and Socrates, we ought not to be angry but lenient if certain persons who are ignorant of, dia of dialectics have been unable to define the nature of rhetoric and on this account have thought when they possess the knowledge that is a necessary preliminary to rhetoric that they had discovered rhetoric and believed 
and believe that by teaching these preliminaries to others, they have taught them rhetoric and completely rhetoric completely, and that the persuasive use of these details and the composition of the whole discourse is a small matter which their pupils must supply of themselves in their writings or speech. Well, Socrates, it does seem as if that which those men teach and write about as the art of rhetoric were such as you describe. I think you are right. But how and from whom is the truly rhetorical and persuasive art to be acquired? Okay. Thank you. So, would you agree we can make divisions now? Let's see. Would you agree there's a nice shift when he moves into popular rhetoric, what he calls the books on rhetoric? Would you agree with that from 266D? There's a whole bunch going. And he mentions them all, does he not? Got that whole section? Mm -hmm. oh. Yes. Then he shifts to the high point of Pericles. Mm -hmm. Popular. Is there a more lofty one? I mean, this is popular. popular. Yeah. Um, Say, what is Socrates in this work? What does he call himself? I think you've got a quote just so I can. Dialectician? Is that what we call Can we infer that from the text? Yeah. What else? He disclaims that he has the art of speech. An art? Speech okay. 262D. I myself have no art. Dialectician? Claims <clears throat> the art. And he talks about this need, likenesses, does he not? Many pages, remember that? On and on and on. Huh. Doesn't he also talk about the following in the footsteps of the man who can divide things properly? Yeah. You know, yeah. that he sees him as a god yeah. and would follow his footsteps, you know. Yeah. Sorry. <coughs> And at that very, at that very, uh, in that very paragraph that you're referring to, he calls himself the lover of such divisions and compositions. Mm -hmm. Just to support your points. Yeah, you can go from one to the many. You can go from one to the many. Are you at two sixty six B? Yes, Mark? yes, cool. sir. Two sixty six B. Okay. Um, there's a couple of interesting 
a lover of truth, we could add that to it. Mm -hmm. but, uh, um, I wrote a couple of paragraphs. I would like to get your cooperation on them. What would you say are high points in the text that we've read? I put a couple of different high points. Can you find a couple more? And we'll play what we introduced. Here, I, I have a quote I can't, it, I don't know if it's a high point or what, it's on 269B. Let's bit, go there, 269. And in this, uh, where so Socrates says, Phaedrus, yeah, 269B. They, they get out there wisely yeah, and yeah. us. And Hold it from on, everybody. Yeah. Go ahead. The, the quote that he gives from... Um, the mellifluous uh, drastus of Pericles, right? They go on and it says, uh, Phaedrus and Socrates, we ought not to be angry but lenient if certain persons who are ignorant of dialectics have been unable to find the nature of rhetoric and on this account of thought, when they possess the knowledge that it is a necessary preliminary to rhetoric, uh, that is a necessary preliminary to rhetoric, that they have discovered rhetoric, and so forth. Um, that part where it says there, uh, the who are ignorant of dialectics is very, you know, you need to know dialectics to know rhetoric. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure you... We we'll use it. Come on. Another one? Yeah. Get more. I, 266D. Two what? 266D. 266D. D. As in doggy dog. Using all of the juicy ones that you bought. They like all. They like reference. Then more. Two sixty six D refers to all of that. Saying, yeah. "Hey, is there anything okay. beautiful left out of what we've already said that could be called an art?" All right, I like that. Um, you know, the trouble with this book is. It's no, and uh, it's always nice to read a new one. <laughs> I got this old thing here I had around. Come, um, beat up. Isn't there a uh, in two sixty six B here where he talks about, but the right hand side. And upon discovering a type of love that shared its name with the other, but was divine, displayed it to our view and extolled it as the source of the greatest goods that can be <coughs> Pardon me. Isn't, okay. that, isn't that the kind of the high point of what he's talking about in terms of love in this section? No. That only the yeah. divine, you know, inspiration, the, the, the right-hand side, yeah, the number on uh, 266 V. I think I don't know. Yeah, what 266. That, that 266 is a hassle. <laughs> yeah, I can see it coming. Yeah, all right. I, I also find it so interesting that he uses the left side as, as sinister and the right side as uh, you know, good. Yeah, That's why it's better to be a conservative. Than a <laughs> I mean, 
why can't the left side be good? I mean, I don't understand Because that. it's backed up to radical. You're coming in from behind. <laughs> okay, by the way. Um, take some of this off here for a moment. I think uh, Lyndon, that was generally Lyndon considered to be like the bad luck side versus the good luck. I know, but that's ignorant superstition. Okay. It's not a fact. So you have a problem with the ancient Greeks? not scientific. Greeks? Superstitious Greeks? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's like saying, you know, Leonardo da Vinci was the uh, agent of the devil because he was left-handed. That's kind of the stupidest well, logic I've well, ever heard. Um, actually, I'm wondering if it has something to do with clockwise and counterclockwise. Yeah. Because, uh. what do you mean? <laughs> I, I mean, you want to know where it comes from, that's probably where it comes from. Coming from the right, you can see it coming. Coming from the left, you're being stabbed in the back. Well, they're just different. Sinister Dexter. They're different <laughs> impulses. It's, that's what it is. That's what I say. It's not a scientific fact. It's just a superstition. <laughs> A blind belief, you know, being persuaded by rhetoric. One isn't good or bad. One's more undoing and one is more... Redoing. You guys are convincing. I, I'm following, it, you know, Ingmar's, you know, lead about being Ken Banker. Mm -hmm. No, well, just well, I, 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 I give you that no. a, a C. I give you that a B. <laughs> So you just to went to Barbara comes back for a moment. But is uh, is love a madness? I'll vote for that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Are there two kinds? Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. What are they? Divine. Divine and that brought about by human the one. disease. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. What's the other? Some other thing. Divine man. Uh, yeah, there, yeah, there are four Disease, uh, well, something else. <laughs> By the way, uh, on this side, uh, what are the categories? Four. four of them. Four. Four. What are they? Four? Yes. Uh, Prophetic, initiatory, uh, Prophetic inspiration. Pro Poetic. The, the muses, let's see. The muses. the muses bring poetry. What? The muses inspire poetry, the poetic. Hold it. The telestic. Prophetic, mystic. Apollo inspires the prophetic prophecy. Dionysus, the mystical. Right? Or telestic. And then Aphrodite and Eros, Eros inspire love, which is the most, the most beautiful, he says. The amatory. The madness of love. The madness of love. Now, look here. Amatory. Let's assume that's right. Okay, just go on. We might change it later, but uh, do you have a quote for that on the? Um, because it's different in two different places, by the way. Two sixty-five B. Two sixty-five B. Not again. <laughs> God, the whole book ends up on this, right? Okay. Well, we're very lucky tonight because uh, we have some people here who are going to help us uh, make distinctions. We do not agree the art of dividing things in classes mm -hmm. is important. Yeah. Yeah, good. Mm -hmm. Are we dividing things in classes here? Dividing things? On the divine? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh. Uh, by the way, um, we do not agree what we need is help. And uh, I think it's only fair that... Yeah, but, well, Josh and Chris... They're right there. They can give us all the help. Yeah, and I heard they even studied... That the table back there, we'll get the telephone. Okay. Earlier in the evening. Um, <laughs> the three of you get together, please, and tell us the differences between... Uh, 
the Apollonian Dionysius uh, mm -hmm. and the Muses, the distinctions between them? Because there may be, watch them, there may be resemblance, there may be likenesses. We're talking about the same thing, one category, but it has divisions. Now, uh, see, while he's covering, a lot of people focus on this stuff. And he covers it, doesn't he? He covers it. Is it possible that we can find in the Phaedrus evidence for every one of those? That'd be nice. That would be nice. Look here. That's why I was hoping someone would find a good quote because Socrates somewhere in there calls himself Mantic. That he's a he's mantic. But wait a minute. That's mystical, isn't it? I don't know. That's why I was going to put it on the board. Prophetic. But anyhow, look here. See, we can apply this to Lysias' speech. He does it. But is it possible then we can find evidence for these things in the text itself? That is to say, does he exhibit it himself? Does the art of rhetoric in his mind presuppose someone moving on these higher realms? And including, uh, there's one here, let's just take a look at it, 265B, did you say? I don't know. That's where, and we made, or 66. And we made four divisions of the divine madness. Um, right, right there on 265B. There's a sentence there that's rather curious. That there are two kinds of madness, one arising from human diseases and the other from divine release from customary habits. <laughs> customary habits. Hmm. Ever study people getting caught up in customary habits? Yeah. Huh. Being released from them. <laughs> now we have four divisions then, don't we? And uh, doesn't Phaedrus describe himself as being well? Socrates describes Phaedrus as having a whole series of customary habits, right? Yeah. So, and yet he's at this moment, right? That he would take the speech of Lysias, that he would sit with it, that he would memorize it, that he would spend hours with it, and so, and yet, yet with Socrates, he's doing something other. Uh -huh. So there might be a divine release in that. Yes. Yes. Hmm. Okay, why are we doing this, you see? If I can direct your attention to the possibility that his art is going to make these distinctions within the work itself and give evidence that he can talk about them, revealing, as it were, their truth, because that's one of the concepts, agree, that he insists upon, the art of rhetoric was time. If that is the case, then these translations, if there is anything lofty in it that is under-translated, we'll miss it. We'll miss the higher, the more lofty. Look, here, let's do it again. If these are the lofty aspects of the dialogue, and if we can see them being discussed in the end of the work in terms of the art of rhetoric, <coughs> But the translators underwrite it, under translate it, then they're really in here. Why? Because if the language necessary to make these distinctions is already here on a higher level, you see in a translation, they'll give you 
a series of possibilities. What we would like to see is with certain key terms, what is the highest and more profound among <coughs> those? And there's also the everyday. Well, okay, know the everyday, but we would also like to know the highest, especially if it throws light on, which we can then use for our real purpose. Because the dialogue is really about this. Now, this list on 266 is very, pardon me, 265B. Uh, he runs around one, he leaves it in the sentence I just read, hidden, hidden release from customary habits, right? Because earlier he talks about that as the function of the civils. Mm -hmm. right? he, he disguises, he drops that out here. He mentions it earlier. He describes it as a function here at 265B. So keep that in mind, that he's playing. So, Barbara, have you possibly read this work? I <clears throat> have read some parts of it. And possibly any section in here do you know of? Um, uh, have you done any work on that? Actually, the one that we, we were discussing at different points was yep. at 270, wasn't Let's it? Let's do it. 270 what? Um, oh, am I right? Let me look at, let me look at this. Uh, well, right, the paragraph after where we stopped, I think. 270? Pardon me, everybody get there. Or, yeah. Oh, where is it? Uh, hmm. One of the um, quotes we were talking about. Oh, good. That's a good one. Let's use it. The, the one. First, would you read it? Well, it says, all, all great arts demand discussion and high speculation about nature. For this loftiness of mind and effectiveness in all directions seem somehow to come from such pursuits. Now, this just for a moment. Notice how absurd that is as a translation. Just English. <laughs> You're at 270? Uh, just before that, by about four lines. So you could call it 269E6 or something. Oh, this one is better. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Barbara. So I was looking, because it just seems like such a strange thing. So I was looking at what is, what is in, in particular high speculation, right? And the term in the Greek is meteor, meteorologios. And it turns out that... Um, it comes from two terms. Logios can mean an a, a treatise, but the other word can mean something that is suspended in midair. And I think what's particularly important for us, it can mean um, heavenly bodies, treatises about heavenly bodies, or things in the height of the heavens, which, and which is what they talk about the highest part of heaven, in the the journey of the soul. Right, they make the ascent up to the colorless, formless, truly existing right. essence in her, right. and that if you if you had that if you had a translation that allowed you to see that geography, so to speak, of the dialogue, then you would see that when he talks about Anaxagoras, um, uh, who who taught him about the nature of mind and lack of mind, that's what that whole area is concerned with. New, it's news, right? And uh, so it seemed like that's a, an example where you'd really want them to be as precise as possible with respect to the earlier metaphors. Okay. okay. Thomas Taylor. Okay. Then. Stay in that sentence, okay? Uh, could you read it giving a full expression of what you see behind it? All great arts. Um, okay. Demand. Discussion isn't a bad translation, but um, uh, you might say, what? Uh, a con well, if you were giving the best thing, you expression to it, you'd want to say a treatise about the highest contemplation that there is, right? As exhibited in the higher parts of the Phaedrus itself. The metaphysics, right. 
Therefore, if someone were to say, excuse me, that's not what that sub subject is about. It's about high speculation. It's about <laughs> nature. Right. And that's yeah. about trees and flowers and right, bugs because, and bees and things like that. Okay. Right. All the way through this nature business isn't, it, it isn't nature as we understand it. Yeah. This isn't nature as you were it isn't describing. Nature. Yeah, right. Yeah. It could easily be confused. Right. That's right. Yeah. Could it, could it be translated properties of the soul of human beings? No. And their expression in the physical? Try it. No. Because? Well, I mean, because if it's, if it's the highest, and you're looking at the, the architecture of the dialogue, the highest speculations are not about qualities of the soul. I mean, there is a place that can, we can describe the kind of speculation that he in fact describes of the journey of the soul reaching the highest level of reality. Right, it's not that the soul cannot attain it. No. Right, no. the soul can no. attain it. No. All right, could you go further with the use of mind in there from Pericles? Well, he said... Great natural abilities. Right, for it was, I think, his falling in with an exagoras who was just such a man, that filled him with, and see, this is the same term again, that filled him with these meteorologias, and uh, taught him the nature of mind and lack, lack of mind. And those two things would go together if he's reflecting on someone who's taking the journey up to the highest part of the, of the reality, highest part of reality. If we were to speculate about that very passage in, in the Phaedrus, where he talks about the soul's journey into mm -hmm. the highest reality, mm -hmm. we would be engaged in high speculations. Right. That's right. And we'd have to be dealing about the nature of mind. Sorry, we? you're quite right, yes. Right. So when we get there and do it, we will be doing this paragraph. Right. And so when, when, so Socrates engaging, engaging Phaedrus is parallel to mm -hmm. Anaxagoras engaging... A uh, Peric Pericles engaged. Oops, and Exagoras engaging Pericles, right? Because the Socrates that is then in the position of the person with treatises about these high matters that he's sharing with Phaedrus. Yeah. Okay. Phaedrus See, it's the last sentence in that paragraph I want to get okay. to. Okay. Okay. It's a key one. Right. Keep going. So it says um, subjects about which Anaxagoras used to used chiefly to discourse. And from these, and of course there isn't. Right. It doesn't say speculations in the Greek. And from these he drew and applied to the art of speaking what is of use to it. Which is so interesting. What does that mean? Um, it's a very interesting term for of use to. Pros for on. What contributes to it in a way. Of use to understanding the highest speculation? The mind and no mind? You see if you see that they're not speculations but actual discourses, right? He used it to discourse news, and it? what? It isn't news, is it? Understanding it, news in the Greek? Mind, where it says mind and lack of mind, yeah. that's where it's news. Ah, uh, okay. Now look, we want to stay with that, don't we? Yes. Okay. If someone then is making such speculations that we were describing, which we will be doing when we get into that section in the Phaedrus, where exactly. the soul journeys up to the highest heaven of the banquet in heaven yes. in order yes. to perceive the nature of reality, yes. right? right? Then you're involved in mind, and talking about the mind and the lack of mind, lack of mind, you're not able to journey too high, mm -hmm. right? Well, what does this mean? He drew and applied to the art of speaking what is of use to it? Mm -hmm. What's the it? Had he not, had there not been Pericles and Anaxagoras, then he would not have been able to 
apply his art to what is used to it, what to, to what is used to the art of speaking. To it. Yeah. And the art of speaking, of course, is the, the technique of Logon, right? So, of Logos. 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 Yeah. Right. The art of Logos. Uh-huh. You lack the art. You, you lack the art of the logos. You, you lack it if you're not able to make speculations such as we are doing and what he's writing mm-hmm. about, mm-hmm. and bring them across into it. That's yeah. right. Car- right. right. It's, you know, it's an image of pulling. Then we can bring to the art of logos what is of use to it, mm-hmm. because there is no art of logos that doesn't reach the highest heavens. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ah. ah. Right. That's one of my favorite ones. You want to hear Thomas Taylor on that paragraph? Yes, please, jump in. Thomas Taylor. All the great arts require continual meditation oh, yeah. and a discourse about the sublime parts of nature. For an elevation of intellect and a perfectly efficacious power appear in a certain respect to proceed from hence, which Pericles possessed in conjunction with his naturally good disposition. For meeting, I think, with Anaxagoras, who had these requisites, he was filled with elevated discourse and comprehended the nature of intellect and folly, which Anaxagoras diffusely discussed. And from hence he transferred to the art of discourse whatever could contribute to its advantage. Whatever mm-hmm. could contribute to, to its advantage. To its advantage, its benefit, mm-hmm. its advantage. Mm-hmm. Right. Intellect and folly. <laughs> Barbara had that nailed that though intellect and folly you nailed that and you nailed wow. the continual meditation that was a continual meditation discourse. that's the journey it's interesting what he does with that you say you make the practice that put it into words what are you doing <laughs> okay what? you're doing the art of logos you're, you're in bringing the art of logos that. Mm-hmm. yeah ah <clears throat> Plus, yeah. That's why we need a couple of more translations. Can I read you one? <laughs> Let's have a one. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. Maybe, maybe, you'll, maybe you'll... What uh, uh, have you got? It's, uh, all great arts, all the great arts, need to be supplemented by philosophical chatter and daring speculation about the nature of things. From this source appear to come the sublimity of thought and the all-around completeness which characterize them. Now, Pericles added these qualities to his own natural gifts. He fell in with Anaxagoras, who was a thinker of this type. By steeping himself in speculation, arrived at a knowledge of the nature of reason and unreason, the favorite subject, no doubt, of Anaxagoras' discourse, from which Pericles drew and applied to the art of speaking whatever was relevant to him. Good. Now, could we do one more thing? Let's pick on this word nature and see how he deals with it. Right? Like the way we use the word nature, perhaps it should be capital N. Right? But what he means by nature is not what we call nature at all. Could you pick up, Barbara, at uh, the following quote from yours, 270? D. Um, the method of the art of. Then mm-hmm. see what Hippocrates and true true reason say about nature. Okay. Push it <clears throat> then see what Hippocrates and true reason. Stephanus? Sorry. Uh, it is 270 D. <clears throat> then see what Hippocrates and true reason say about nature. In considering the nature of anything, that's right, this is beautiful, Um, must we not consider first whether that in respect to which we wish to be learned ourselves and to make others learned is simple or multiform? And then, if it is simple, inquire what power of acting it possesses or of being acted upon and by what? And if it has many forms, number them, and then see in the case of each form, as we did in the case of the simple nature, what its action is and how it is acted upon and by what. 
Okay, look. Hey, love one. Does that various forms? Mm -hmm. Apply that paragraph to what we're talking about. And the in this paragraph, the word learned yeah. um, is actually the word technikos, technikoi. And that means, uh, of course, uh, ha having the, the skill of an art. Skill being, art. being art, uh, having an art. To be artful. Yes. Uh, that should have been changed, shouldn't someone should have changed that? And you just changed it. Yeah. Good. Well, Taylor says both that right? we ourselves Right, especially should the be idea of art. What, what, what? I'm sorry, Taylor says both that we ourselves should be artists. Ah, that's better, you know? No, oh, better. What translation is that? Taylor. Pardon? Taylor. Is that Thomas? No. English? No. And simple has that old sense, right, of non, non multiple, right, non many. See, it's not a, simple. We can have some fun. If it is true that the higher, the more fuller, what shall we say, the more the best and most accurate expression of the higher part of this exploration of the art of dialogue, the art of logos, the art of rhetoric, philosophy requires this kind of reflection and then we sit back and say hey you know what it looks like Thomas Taylor is doing a better job than Loeb mm -hmm. but most criticism of Thomas Taylor is one is that he's Neoplatonist and it's not there mm. he's reading into it mystical lore mm. well Remember, Barbara's offering it tonight, not me, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how about that? I think you had another beautiful couple of paragraphs. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, you were asking at one point about... Well, no, no, you pick. Yeah, yeah. Weren't you asking at some point about how Socrates may have shown certain... States of mind. Yes, I'll take it. So, well, you know, we stopped with ex with um, uh, we stopped at uh, where is that? Darn it! Where he described himself as being in ex in an ex state ex static state, right? Where am I? Where he's in the in the Greek word is enthusias, enthusiasm, yeah. which means God God in. Uh, possessed by a god or god within or something along that line. What did I do with it? <coughs> oh, I cannot find my quote. And then there's the one where he's possessed by the nymphs in an earlier section. Yeah, well, well, come on, where's that? Come okay, on. okay. Good. I like that one. I'll get that one. This 265B, by the way, we can also compare it with uh, 244 while Barbara's doing that. Yeah, good, good idea. It's, I have it at 241E. This is Stephanus 241E on the lab 457. Page 457. Where he, oh well, that's an easy one, really. 457 it says, I shall surely be possessed of the nymphs to, who you, to whom you purposefully exposed me. And at the end of the speech, he does, he does say that not only that he shall be, but that he is, that he's, he must be because he's speaking dithyrams. And that's the other one I'm looking for. So let me find that one while you go on. To, uh, in that E, beyond dithyram? And I've gotten beyond dithyram? Yeah. 
What page? What page is that, Linda? That's where uh, he described it's, uh, himself. Two forty one e. Sorry. Stephanus is two forty one e. Where he says, "My dear man, haven't you noticed that I got beyond this plan sure. and am breaking out ages?" Yeah, but that isn't the one I was looking at. No, okay. Thank you. That was the one I just just read. You're you're right, but are we trying to find all of the descriptions that Socrates gives of himself as well, being? We're shopping for anything that looks what we we would call profound and then see that whether or not using other translations or someone who has a knowledge of the Greek can add a greater depth to it than the English translation gives us. He calls himself a seer. He calls himself a, a seer at 242C. 240? 2, 242C. Two, two well, that's it. Now I am a seer, not a very good one, but as the bad writers say, good enough for my own purposes. Yeah, that's... Uh, so how prophetic the soul is. Yeah, you see. Um, that was in a, kind of a humorous... Now that's Manticos, right? I think he's all the way. But don't you, <coughs> don't you think... In that particular paragraph, yeah. Socrates yeah. is not downing himself as much as trying to pass on the idea that no matter how good we are, we're all really, you know, fall short. Mm. And, you know, even though we may have some powers, you know, he's saying be cautious, you know, don't get caught, you know, and because you have some powers, you know, thinking that you're somebody. He's That's there too. Even, yeah. even I, you know, yeah. know my limits. Yeah. Right. As Dirty Harry says, a guy's got to know his limits. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But in that quote, if he says that he has a prophetic soul, and we're interested in to what degree he is willing to say he he can be classified in these four. Then we want to see if there is evidence in the dialogue itself of him functioning that way. Hmm. So well, didn't he make he, up a whole dialogue, a whole rhetor, rhetor, rhetorical description for Phaedrus here? He, he imitated a speech as if he were Lysias. Are you still? Are you working on the word prophetic at this yeah, point? Well, or the he other? said. He, it's a, it would be inspired. It would be an okay, example. Like, that would fit the muses. Right. Yeah. right. I would, yeah. Maybe also that he he wraps his head up, which ends up being somewhat prophetic in that uh, he doesn't do a dishonor to the gods then because he's... But maybe the, I mean, that's not really prophetic. It's just kind of uh, knowing well, what he's going to say. Which is... But is, See, there, is knowing there are use of the word. Yeah. We have to... Oh, oh. We have to be open to it all, certainly. But there's different kinds of prophetic mm. utterances and experiences. This, right? Remember, he makes that big distinction right, be between what we would call natural prophecies and making prophecies in respect well, to the natural world. Augury. And the two the differences are... Oh, sorry, I was thinking... Oh, okay, this. okay, okay. What are the differences? Well, one is that you, a black cat crosses your path and some kid says, that's bad luck. Agree. Or in the Odyssey, a bird flies off to the left. Ah, a sign that there's going to be a failure. Using natural events as signs to interpret for the future. That's different than that great example of uh, in the Ion, or, in the, or better yet, in Homer. Uh, where the seer sees the action taking place before it takes place. He sees what's happening. Mm -hmm. uh, remember that great book? <coughs> yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. 
beautiful. Yeah, he, they're, they're, all the suitors are sitting around drinking or something, but when he looks into the hall, he sees the death and the blood and the destruction, and they're dying and their souls going to Hades. And, and their like, souls rushing off to Hades. That, that's in the Odyssey. But what was the other one, the Ion? It's from the Odyssey. Oh, it's I, from the Odyssey. I thought you referenced the Ion as well. Well, it was a mistake. Oh, okay. But the first is from the Ion. A bird flying off. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not Plato's Ion, but the tragedy, the Ion? Or? No. In Plato's dialogue, the Ion, there are two kinds of prophetic right. pronouncements. Oh, okay. One is false and one is true, because if he has the art, he must be able to distinguish between the true and the false, and there are the two kinds, and one is true and one is false, and therefore he takes one from the Iliad, one from the Odyssey. Oh, okay. And thank therefore, you. wouldn't you agree the best thing we can do is quit? Wait, wait. Let me give no, you, go. Let me, let me give you this one, which is that I'll it's take it. uh, Stephanus. This is the one I was looking for. Good. Stephanus 238D. 238? Yeah. Yeah, well, we were talking about this. That's all right. I'll take a 238. 238D or a low page 447. It says, um, Well, my dear Phaedrus, does it seem to you, as it does to me, that I am inspired? And uh, which, which actually is um, experience of a divine experience, theon pathos, right? A divine. He's undergoing the di divine divinity. So it says, then listen to me in silence, for truly the place seems filled with a divine presence. So do not be surprised if I often seem to be in a frenzy. Mm -hmm. And that word be in a frenzy that they're translating is actually to be possessed of the nymphs again. So in a dialogue that takes place in uh, a place <laughs> sacred to the nymphs as well as to Pan, yeah. then not to translate nymphs yeah. in the dialogue there. is really... Great. Keep going. Well, so it just seemed like here he's showing, uh, he's showing that... He both recognizes it in himself, and he's saying to Phaedrus, "You know, do you see it that um, that he that he's under he's having an experience of the divine? The place is filled with the divine, and therefore his discourse is going to have that as its source. Can we say, or going to be influenced by that?" Okay, we're in <laughs> divine fury. That's what they say here. Well, I have one in terms of prophecy at the end where he talks about 279b. Yes, read it. I think he has a nature. Uh, I saw for Jesus a young cat figure. However, I am willing to say when I prophesize for him, I think he has a nature above the speeches of Lysias and possesses a nobler character so that I should not be surprised if, as he grows older, he should so excel in his present studies that all who have ever treated of rhetoric shall seem less than children. And I suspect oh. that these studies will not satisfy him. Thank you. But a, divine, but a more divine impulse will lead him to greater things. For my friend, something of philosophy is inborn in his mind. This is the message that I carry from these deities to my favorite Isocrates. And do you carry the other to Lysias, your favorite? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, then Good. hold this it. one more was like a lead up to the quote that Barbara gave on 236. Um, I guess A.D., um, where Socrates says, um, Sorry, again, uh, with the Stephanus? 235C, I cannot say just at this moment, but I have certainly heard something either from the lovely Sappho or the wise Anacreon, or perhaps from some prose writers. What ground have I for saying so? Mm. Well, my dear friend, I feel that my own bosom is full. full. And that I could make another speech different from this and quite as good. Now, I am conscious of my own ignorance. And I know very well that I have never invented these things myself. So the only alternative is that I have been filled. 
through the ears like a pitcher from the wellsprings of another. But again, because of my stupidity, I have forgotten how and from whom I heard it, which is like uh, he is in some kind of a divine state. Yeah, Stephanus number? 235C. 235C. Oh, you're getting into that earlier part. Okay, look here. <laughs> Let's assume now we have gone through 258 to 261. All right, a couple of pages right. for next time. Let's assume that. Mm, okay. And keep that in mind because now we can start the dialogue from the beginning. <laughs> Since we then will have gone through the earlier part of the art of rhetoric. Agreed? Yes. Right. Okay. Now, word of caution. If you want to work on any of these more profound sections, please share it. Have it ready. Maybe we'll spend time next week in doing that before going into from the beginning to the end. Right? What do you think? So 258, 261. Sure. Yeah. Well, the end of the the end of Socrates' second speech is approximately 258. Yeah, so that. Then the art of rhetoric then goes to the end of the dialogue. To the end of the dialogue. We didn't there. cover this, but it's pretty clear. And we'll, okay, we'll do it, as well as good quotes. What about it? Then we'll wait for another week before we go from the beginning to the end. All right. Okay. Okay, fair? fair. Okay. Thank you. Fun? Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Mm. Anybody else going to be picking up any of these uh, new books? Any of these books? Yeah, these are very fine pieces of work that Rose on. All right. Yeah. What is the what second? Is, what is the second?